Good evening, I'm Wendy Mesley, and this is The National. Hunger and misery on a shocking scale in Bangladesh. There's so many people here, most of them women and very young children. Nala Ayed on feeding a makeshift city born of persecution. Your president on Twitter more than a 12-year-old saying the most outrageous things. Toronto Raptors side with NFLers who defy Donald Trump with anthem protests. Plus, Canada's team leaders at the Invictus Games. They know all about pushing through adversity. I wanted to go back to Afghanistan on one leg. Uh, just, you know, saying it out loud sounds a bit crazy. It has been one of the most rapid movements of a desperate people in decades. One month ago today, Rohingya Muslims by the thousands began flowing into Bangladesh from their home villages in Myanmar, fleeing deadly violence. Tonight, nearly half a million are struggling to exist in haphazard tent cities, traumatized and hungry. The sheer speed of the exodus, the staggering number of men, women and children arriving daily in one of the poorest countries on earth has left aid agencies overwhelmed. Arnala Ayed is hearing their stories firsthand as one of the few Western journalists to make it to the border. The grueling, back-breaking work of keeping close to half a million people alive. This is beyond an emergency. This is a race, a rush to beat back the vast swaths of hunger. Several time zones away from the world's top headlines. They're lining up in the heat, standing for hours with no water or food. But with a little patience, he says, no one would walk away empty-handed. <laughs> Mohammed Idris sustains himself with the hope of providing for a household of 10. <laughs> There's no rice or lentils in my home, he says, and he has no money. <laughs> More than 430,000 people have so far come into this country. They're lined up here because almost every single one of them is dependent on handouts. So the scale is just vast. Um, there's so many people here, most of them women and very young children. It's hard to appreciate just how huge the influx into Bangladesh is without seeing it. An exodus of such vast proportions that in the border region, there are people just everywhere. The army only now called in to try to contain the chaos. The camps that first went up to house the earlier arrivals quickly acquire suburbs. A maze of extensions, seemingly always a step ahead of official plans. <laughs> Ravaged by the trauma of persecution and escape, they're now exposed to new risks disease, the monsoon rains, and the relentless temperatures. I can't stay inside because of the heat, she says. The vulnerability, the desperation, play out on every corner. The burden just too much for this little girl. One of more than 90,000 stateless children with no access to schooling, most of whom with zero medical attention. Most urgent is uh, sanitation and medical facilities. These are the urgency. The urgency underlines everything here. The poor turning to a poor country for help. And with so many lives at stake, for now, no is not an option. Nala Ayed, CBC News, Ukia District, Bangladesh. Even as Aung San Suu Kyi continues to insist there is no military campaign against the Muslim minority, many leaders around the world, including Canada's foreign affairs minister today, have declared it ethnic cleansing. The House of Commons will hold an emergency debate on the situation tomorrow evening. 
To the U.S. now, it's not like President Donald Trump to back down in the face of widespread criticism. And true to form today, he didn't. Trump continued to attack NFL players who kneeled during the national anthem as a form of protest. And what was once a simmering debate has now exploded. Paul Hunter has our story. And the rock is red and glare. From football players this weekend, unprecedented defiance. But tweeted Donald Trump tonight in return, tremendous backlash against the NFL and its players for disrespect of our country. Indeed, with some videos set to the Star Spangled Banner today, YouTube was littered with homemade examples of fans burning NFL jerseys and gear. I stand for America. I stand for the American flag. But, say many players who took part, the essence of the protest is racial injustice. Last year, former NFLer Colin Kaepernick began kneeling to highlight police violence against African Americans. And a handful of other players followed his lead. But when Trump ridiculed them last Friday... Get that son of a bitch off the field right now. Out. He's fired. He's fired! Instead of backing down, some 200 joined in. Today, star quarterback Tom Brady spoke out against Trump. I, I certainly disagree with, you know, what he said and, 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 you know, thought it was just divisive. In today rebuking Trump, basketball star LeBron James saluted NFL players, fans, and owners. There was no divide. There's no divide, even from... Um, even from that guy that, that continues to try to divide us as people. And as some have drawn parallels with the U.S. civil rights movement, for the footballers, Justice this message today from Capitol Hill. There are members of the United States Congress who have your back. One result of all of it, it's politicized even associating with Donald Trump. This weekend, the NHL's Pittsburgh Penguins, no strangers to the White House in years past, accepted Trump's invite for a return trip. Star Sidney Crosby called it a great honor, leaving some fans let down, perplexed and enraged as the Good White afternoon. House pressed on against NFLers who kneel. I think if this is the debate is really for them about police brutality, they should probably protest the officers on the field that are protecting them instead of the American flag. And as the burned team jerseys underline, the fact is there are plenty of Americans who might well agree with the White House on that. One of the players, an Army veteran who defied his team and stood for the anthem yesterday, learned today that his jersey is now all of a sudden among the league's top sellers. Paul Hunter, CBC News, Washington. This has spread beyond football and beyond borders, too. Howard Gould spent some time with the Toronto Raptors and found strong opinions. Photo day for Canada's only NBA team. The day before training camp opens for the Toronto Raptors in Victoria, B.C. Happy new season. Not entirely. Robert Quinn of the 49ers. He had teammate Justin Brett. Not with the growing protests in the U.S. The, bombs bursting in the controversy unavoidable for the Raptors. Many of the players are American. And all of the other teams in the league are based in the U.S. So the American national anthem is played before every Raptors game. Management has already told players whatever they choose to do will be supported. So I can guarantee one thing, nobody's getting fired here. Several appear deeply upset by Trump's scathing denunciations of athletes who take a stand by taking a knee something they say should not be seen as an attack on a flag or a country. You got, you know, um, your president on Twitter more than a 12-year-old saying the most outrageous things for people who's trying to do something right, you know, and it's, it's crazy. DeMar DeRozan, one of the team's top stars, grew up tough, as he put it. I done, I done had friends killed by police officers. Um, couple days after just being at my house, you know, when I was young and even recently. The players are talking amongst themselves about what to do when their games begin. They may not kneel, but it appears they will do something. You know, people say stick and stay in your lane, but our lane is the, 
as human beings is to be human beings. I know we're in Canada, but you know, I think as athletes, we are citizens first. It's been said that this year, the Raptors, as a team, have to find a way to make their offense less predictable. The players and their possible protest are already there. Harvard Gould, CBC News, Toronto. Well, Donald Trump was calling out professional athletes on Twitter this weekend. A desperate situation has been unfolding in a United States territory. Puerto Rico could be on the verge of a humanitarian crisis. They need our help. They need it now. These are our fellow Americans, 3.5 million of them. Five days after Hurricane Maria hit the island, hundreds of thousands of people are still without power. This satellite image from before and after the storm shows the extent of the grid damage. Food, fuel, medical supplies and clean water are running low, and a badly damaged dam is posing a catastrophic threat. Officials warn that it could burst at any moment. Coming up, Ukraine's president seeks peacekeeping help from Canada while rejecting a strange offer from Russia. Russia want to use the peacekeepers kind of the bodyguard. Plus, his long solo mission, returning lost honors to families of heroes. Iraqi Kurds celebrated the end of voting in a symbolic referendum on independence tonight. The vote went ahead despite pressure from Baghdad, Turkey, Iran, even the United Nations. They fear that raising hopes of Kurdish independence too soon will lead to more regional conflict. The final result of the vote is expected in a few days. Germany is also just coming off a vote, a fourth victory for Chancellor Angela Merkel, but a smaller win than she has captured in past elections. And who gained strength is troubling to some. Margaret Evans is in Berlin. On the surface, not much has changed in Germany. Angela Merkel won more than 30% of the vote and coalition talks willing. She's still on track to becoming chancellor for a fourth term. But this was her party's worst showing in an election since 1949. It is a blow to the political centre. What's more, it's one that's opened the door here to the far right. And that shocked many Germans. For the first time ever um, since the end of the war, a right-wing extremist party entered the Bundestag. It's a protest to, to an extent, but we have to admit that this, these feelings do exist among the German people. The AfD 13. The alternative for Germany, or AFD, took about a million votes away from Angela Merkel's Christian Democratic Union, its support stronger in the former East German states. Formed in 2013, the AFD has capitalized on unease in Germany in the wake of the 2015 refugee crisis and what many saw as Merkel's arrogance in acting on her own. And in this election campaign, the AFD has delivered one message, Merkel must go. But party officials insist they do have a broader agenda. We are the only party concentrating on the traditional family. We are the only party to reject the idea of man-made global warming. We are the only party to, to resist uh, rising energy costs. But the AFD is far from a unified force, constantly riven by infighting. And analysts say even people who voted for them might not know very much about them. They are against refugees coming to uh, uh, Germany. They are against Islam. They are against, I mean, that's what the party s started out with. They are against the euro. But we don't know what they are actually are for. It is also possible, of course, that the result is simply a reflection of a country tired of having the same government for 12 years now. The worry, though, for some is that a door has been opened that cannot again be easily closed, one that will lead to the intolerance and hatred that have so haunted this country in the past. That's why some people took to the streets in protest last night against AFD gains here in Berlin and in other German cities like Frankfurt and Cologne. Like it or not, something has shifted in German politics. Margaret Evans, CBC News, Berlin. Chelsea Manning says she will appeal a Canada Border Services decision to deny her entry to Canada. 
Manning says she tried to enter Quebec last week but was turned away because of her 2013 U.S. conviction for leaking classified information. She tweeted out a letter she was given which cites Manning's espionage charges and says, if committed in Canada, this offence would equate to an indictable offence, namely treason. Criminal conviction and conviction for espionage are grounds for border officials to deny an individual entry to Canada. Work is supposed to be an environment where you feel safe, but a correctional officer at a BC prison says that wasn't the case for her. Tracy Mercier is going public tonight about a workplace that she says didn't do enough to stop bullying and sexual harassment. She told her story to Erica Johnson. Tracy Mercier says the trouble began almost as soon as she started working at Mountain Institution three years ago. She says a colleague bullied her. Then this. That's where you say you were sexually assaulted? Yes. Mercier has watched this prison surveillance tape many times. The male colleague presses a long metal instrument that looks like a flashlight between her buttocks. I was shocked. Um, I was absolutely horrified. She asked for a shift change but says superiors refused, says she was even told not to bother filing a complaint. If I had gone ahead at this point when I was telling him I was going to file a harassment against my coworker, if I go ahead with a harassment against my coworker, all that's going to happen is he's going to get a couple thousand dollar fine and that I'm just wasting my time. Today, Ottawa took notice. This is uh, an unacceptable situation. There needs to be a very clear plan uh, to make sure that this kind of toxic behaviour stops and is not repeated. And Go Public has heard from other female employees at different prisons saying they too have been sexually harassed at work. In a new survey, when asked if they've been harassed on the job in the past two years, 40% of prison employees said yes, up from 31% three years ago. This former longtime corrections employee says the system needs an overhaul. She reported it, she asked the department uh, to protect her, and they failed to do so. Corrections Canada wouldn't give an interview, but stated it's working to eliminate harassment in the workplace. Tracy Mercier wanted her colleague charged with sexual assault, but the Crown said it wasn't in the public interest. The guard was disciplined and is still on the job. Mercier has yet to return to work. Erica Johnson, CBC News, Vancouver. Straight ahead, Donald Trump stokes fear in South Korea. Disgraced former U.S. Congressman Anthony Weiner was sentenced to 21 months in prison today for sending explicit text messages to a 15-year-old girl last fall. Once considered a rising star in the Democratic Party, Weiner brought negative attention to Hillary Clinton's presidential campaign last year. His now former wife, Huma Abedin, was a top aide to Clinton. After doing his time, Weiner must register as a sex offender. The diplomatic conflict between the U.S. and North Korea has escalated yet again after Pyongyang claimed that President Trump had effectively declared war through Twitter, a claim the White House was quick to dismiss today. We've not declared war on North Korea, uh, and frankly, the suggestion of that is absurd. The tweet that enraged the regime suggested that North Korea won't be around much longer. Pyongyang responded by warning it would shoot down American warplanes if it felt threatened. China is appealing to both sides to dial back the rhetoric before things get completely out of hand. And while the world hopes that calmer heads do prevail, Allied forces are preparing for combat. The combined South Korean and American military deterrent is a powerful one. Our Sasha Petrasek got to see its capabilities firsthand. But, as he reports, South Korean officials are in no great hurry to unleash it. This is one of the two main U.S. air bases here in South Korea, in the southwest of the country, near the city of Kunsan. And every day, all day, these jets, F-16s, are going up on training missions. Americans and South Koreans are flying into the unknown. North and South Korea are still technically at war, still training and arming themselves for a 1950s standoff that 
never ended. With the U.S., its jets and bombers and more than 28,000 troops all deeply involved. If U.S. President Donald Trump gives the order to totally destroy North Korea, as he has threatened, Captain Chris Bruiser Brown will be among those doing it. If uh, you know we're tasked to go north and, and take offensive actions, then we're prepared to do so. Indeed, taking it to the north, as it's called here, is top of mind. The border, bristling with armaments, is less than 300 kilometers away. Reaction time is measured in seconds. You have to take that much more uh, time and training to make sure that you're ready. Uh, because if it does happen, it's, or if something kicks off, it's going to start now, and we have to be ready right now. So. The pace of joint exercises with South Korean forces has picked up, sending up missiles and simulating attacks. It's this kind of training and partnership that gives the South its edge. But in Seoul's National Assembly, some have a nagging worry that the U.S. could also be a liability. Trump's comments are making the situation very unstable, says Kim Jong-dae, a member of the Assembly and its National Defense Committee. Trump's impulsive and unpredictable, he says, and he could push us into war against our will. For Seoul, a city of 10 million people right near the border and near North Korea's artillery, that could be catastrophic. As the tensions go up, the training here continues, along with that promise to take the fight to the north. Sasha Petrosik, CBC News, Gunsan, South Korea. Now for something a bit different. They've spent months avoiding the spotlight, but today, Prince Harry and Meghan Markle made their first public outing together in Toronto. The couple grabbed the attention of cameras and onlookers as they walked hand in hand outside City Hall. They were on their way to watch a wheelchair tennis match at the Invictus Games. The prince has been dating the 36-year-old American actress for about a year. Up next, the two wounded warriors leading Canada's Invictus team. When I get, got back to Canada, it's when everything fell apart. And that stress, that adrenaline went down and so did I. There are stories of sacrifice and recovery. Plus, Ukrainian President Petro Poroshenko, he tells Rosemary Barton about his long war and the path to peace. But first, a look now at the day's business numbers. The TSX added 62 points, and the Canadian dollar dropped a sixteenth of a cent. In New York, the Dow lost 53 points, and the price of oil jumped to $52 U.S. It's not a competition for medals, it's not a competition, it's not the Paralympics. It's a competition that will allow us to showcase what men and women that are in Kenyan Armed Forces that have come back from an injury, mental or physical, can accomplish. The Invictus Games are underway in Toronto. Founded by Prince Harry to support sick and wounded soldiers, the event is more than a celebration of sports. Participants bond, share their experiences, and remaster their lives. For the co-captains of Canada's Invictus team, Natasha Dupuis and Simon Meilleur, that's an ongoing process. They shared their stories of war and recovery before this year's Games began. Here's Susan Ormiston with more on their healing journeys. Canadian forces began a combat mission in Kandahar in 2006, battling the Taliban in the south. The mission lasted five years and proved costly. As Master Corporal Natasha Dupuy discovered in 2008. She was in a convoy when an IED blew up the vehicle ahead. soldiers and severely injuring three more. When it happened, my team and, and I were first responders on, on that incident. Uh, while I was approaching the, the scene, it was obvious that uh, not everybody had made it. 
the all incident from explosion to their air evacuation lasted about 20 minutes, so it's very fast, everything. But it appeared more like an hour to me. Made worse, Dupuy quickly realized that two of her closest team members were dead. She, Corey Hayes, and Jack Boutelier had been virtually inseparable. Now she couldn't recognize them. I was seeing body parts, so when I've never even seen anything like this, everybody kind of start panicking. I remember hearing my 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 teammates screaming, uh, looking for some of our our guys and not finding them. And Dupuy still had to do her job. It was really, really difficult. I remember having to stop for a second and think to myself, okay, Nat, keep your head uh, in the game. Think, practice, and let's do this because it was horrible. Right away, myself, I was sick from all the images, and it was like too much. Uh, physically sick. Then I went on and uh, I did not sleep for three days. Uh, impossible to sleep because my head was spinning, spinning, and I was uh, seeing all the them image over and over. While not physically hurt, inside Dupuy was shattered. So there was two months left to that mission, and I did finish the whole rotation. When I look back, I really don't know how I, I did it. I think the stress, the adrenaline, and you know, there's this feeling where you don't want to let down your teammates, so I did manage to finish. But when I got back to Canada, it's when everything fell apart. And that stress, that adrenaline went down, and so did I. It wasn't until she rotated back to Canada that she could take off her mental armor. She went straight to a staff psychiatrist who diagnosed her with PTSD. I was having crying spells, flashbacks, insomnia, nightmares. I couldn't function at all, like making food for myself was too much of a task. Within those few years, I think I was only surviving. That's all that matters. Uh, to tell you the truth, I thought life had no more to offer. Uh, I knew I was losing my career, uh, lost my identity because uh, a big part of me was my military career. Dupuy knew she needed help. So she found and then joined Soldier On, a program supporting injured and ill Canadian Forces members through adaptive sports and a Team Canada sponsor for the Invictus Games. They provide a very safe environment, non-judging uh, environment to exchange with other ill and injured that have gone through similar experiences. in my recovery. I was often scared uh, to be seen having a breakdown, so I just stayed home. Dupuy's journey is ongoing, but as co-captain for Team Canada at this year's Invictus Games, she's back in command of her life, a strong leader for others to follow. For Major Simon Mayu, Team Canada's co-captain for Invictus, the story is as similar as it is different. Mayu was on a night mission in Kandahar in 2007 when an IED ripped his command vehicle apart. If I could describe it, a bomb is, is nothing like we see in the movies. It's not a big flame. It's just a big pressure heat wave in your face. And that's all I remember from the event itself. So that I woke up, uh, I, I, I was on the ground, I felt like I got beaten up by people, I felt like I've, I was out of it. Uh, I lift my, le uh, my head and I saw the back of the vehicle 
uh, I was in, uh, torn apart. Uh, I saw bodies inside, unfortunately. Uh, and quite quickly, though, the, the fire started inside the vehicle. We were carrying so much ammo, it started to ca catch fire. So uh, my driver dragged me on the ground and brought me behind a concrete wall so I could be safe, because it started to explode, actually, at that point. Uh, I didn't know then, uh, my jaw was fractured, my leg was in tatters. Uh, but other than that, I was looking for my rifle, I was looking for my pistol. I was trying to get back in control of the situation, but uh, I was in and out of consciousness. It was, it was hard to do. The explosion killed three of his men and literally tore a piece of him away. I remember the evacuation. I remember a Black Hawk helicopter lifting us up. Uh, I was out of it after that, completely. I woke up in Germany. I evacuated in one of the hospital the Americans have over there. Um, first thing you do is a pat check. You check what you got, and long and behold, there's something missing. Like Dupuy, Meilleux knew he needed help. His recovery strategy was built on returning to active duty, no matter what. I left Kandahar on a stretcher, yelling to my guys, I'll be back, just wait for me. You know, I thought I was going to take two weeks, patch it up and, and be back. Um, it took two years. I had uh, unfinished business over there. I needed to get it done. I needed to come back. Incredibly, he returned to Afghanistan, the first Canadian amputee to go back into active combat duty. And when we arrived at Canada Airfield, actually, the first foot that touched down at the tarmac over there was a prosthetic. So I said, you know, um, maybe that's going to bring me some luck. Uh, but I was back on a convoy two weeks later. So things are going, and the mission needs to go on. Meilleux is a platoon commander for the Royal 22nd Regiment, the Vandus, based in Valcartier, Quebec. He says his struggle and recovery lends reassurance to those he now leads. Every time I was going to the gym in shorts or something, and some people saw that, they felt like we had something strong going on. It reassured them that if something happened to them, the worst happened to them, um, they were going to be taken care of. He didn't get there alone. The soldier on program helped Mayu through athletics and support. And high-tech prosthetics allow him to do things he never could have imagined. This year, in the Toronto Games, he's running the 100, 200 and 400 meter races. Mayu is proud of his accomplishment, but he's eager to share the credit with his wife. You can't do this alone. She was my rock. Whenever I needed help, coming back from a bad day, she was always there. And she accepted that I was a crazy man. I wanted to go back to Afghanistan on one leg. Uh, just, you know, saying it out loud sounds a bit crazy, but she, she said, yeah, okay, if that's what you want, we'll do it. Each of these leaders chosen as co-captains for Invictus has fought to overcome a devastating injury one internal, one physical. Proof, they say, that with help, injured soldiers can and do carry on. Susan Ormiston, CBC News, Toronto. Coming up, Europe's forgotten war. As Ukraine fights Russian-backed separatists, it's asking for help from Canada. Russia wants control over Ukraine and undermine every effort to restore our sovereign control within Ukraine's border. That was Ukrainian President Petro Poroshenko making his case last week to the United Nations. He's desperate for peacekeepers to bring law and order to the Donbass region of the country. Since 2014, it's been the site of clashes with Russian-backed fighters. Tonight, he explains how Canada could help defuse a crisis in an exclusive interview with Rosemary Barton. Neighborhoods destroyed. Casualties mounting. 
Near daily shelling continues as the war between Ukrainian forces and Russian-backed separatists in eastern Ukraine stretches now into its fourth year. The situation is unpredictable and unstable at the moment. At least 10,000 people have died since fighting began in 2014. More than a million and a half lives uprooted, caught in the crossfire in a war the United Nations says has no end in sight. The Ukrainian president used his speech to world leaders last week to point to Russia as the cause of the violence. Kidnapping people, conducting hidden war, towing civilian aircraft. Russia is not a contributor to the international security, but its biggest threat. Russian President Vladimir Putin denies any direct role in the conflict. Efforts to broker an end to fighting have failed. While Kiev and Moscow claim they want a UN peacekeeping mission in eastern Ukraine, both sides have so far rejected how to make that happen. President Poroshenko, nice to see you. Very nice to see you. Nice of you to make the time. Uh, you, you met with the Prime Minister, Prime Minister Trudeau, and you did discuss a future role for Canada uh, in Ukraine, even though we're doing things now, but you, I think you called them new initiatives. What did you propose to him? Uh, what would you like Canada to do more of? Uh, definitely the most important thing, this is the possible peacekeeping operation to bring peace back to my land and to stop the Russian aggression. And it was extremely important because Canada has a unique experience. He was, the Canada was the leader of the peacekeeping operation and was the country responsible in the United Nations for the whole of peacekeeping. And uh, I uh, fully satisfied with the, our discussion with the Prime Minister Trudeau. So you, you likely know that Canada has been promising a peacekeeping mission since this government came into power and has yet to commit to something. Mm -hmm. So did the Prime Minister seem to you more open to a peacekeeping mission in Ukraine uh, than perhaps other places? I have a feeling that he's absolutely open. Uh, he's very professional. He was very well prepared. So y y you, you made this plea at the UN and you made it again t to our Prime Minister, but you made it knowing that the Russian president has also made a proposal for Russia to be part of that peacekeeping mission. What, what do you think is really going on there? No, this is absolutely impossible on the statute of the uh, United Nations that Russia can be the part of the peacekeeping mission because Russia is the site of the conflict. Russia is an aggressor. Of course, the his uh, Russian proposal is unacceptable because Russia want to use the peacekeepers as kind of the bodyguard mm -hmm. for the uh, observers of the uh, special military mission of OEC, which is absolutely against the statute. But given the, the power that the Russia has at the UN, what is the likelihood that there would be a UN operated peacekeeping mission? Ah, this is very simple because Russia, when they illegally annexation Crimea and attacked of my nation, completely ruined the whole post-war security system. And if Russia would be the only nation who would be against peacekeeping, it would be very difficult to explain Russian why. Because this is occupied territory, occupied by Russian troops. And in that situation, that would be a recognition of the occupation by Russia. Okay. And with that situation, we will go to the International Court of Justice, and Russia would be responsible for the military crime. Well, that, that leads me to another question about the satellite uh, imagery that Canada was for a, a while uh, yeah. allowing you to have access to to help you with. Yeah. The Trudeau government stopped it. They said it was budgetary reasons, but that seemed hard to understand. Did you broach that with the Prime Minister? And how important were those images? This is not just a matter of Canada, because this is the whole NATO system when provide the immediate uh, access for Ukrainian intelligence to the satellite pictures. Yes. We're talking about that again, not because it's just a curious curiosity, because that can help us effectively to implement Minsk agreement to have an evidence that Russia moved their tanks, artillery system, multi-rocket launch system, and we have an access on that. And Canada, just to be a part of this whole uh, process, and I have no doubt that uh, we will uh, solve this question also. Do you ever feel like um, the war in Ukraine is forgotten in some way? Definitely not. No. If, you, if you see, for example, I don't know, gen last General Assembly of United Nations, the 
Ukraine was mentioned in a significant number of the speeches of all the leaders of the world. Mm -hmm. This is aggression of Russian Federation. This is the illegal annexation of Russian Federation of the Crimea. And the message You have no doubt about that, that it's not Putin me, offering but the whole them world. To do. Yeah. We don't have a doubt uh, about that from, from the very beginning. And I think that was extremely important that this uh, problem is on the top of the international agenda. And I want to thank the whole world for this unity and solidarity they demonstrate to Ukraine. Is there a political settlement for Donbass, and could Canada be part of that, or is it, or is it solely a military pushback that you need? Would you no, consider a, a political negotiation? First of all, we have a, uh, already the scenario. The scenario is Minsk agreement, which yeah. uh, has a security component, and security component is very simple: stop killing Ukrainians, stop uh, make a ceasefire, withdraw Russian army withdraw Russian artillery and heavy armament, uh, release all the hostages. The reality of that happening is slim. If, would, you, would you agree? Look, uh, Rosemary, we need to, ha to be an optimist. And I'm absolutely confident that if we will have a peacekeepers, if Russia take, because of the peacekeepers, their troops out of the Donbass, we don't have any conflict between the people. Mm. And with, if we disarm all the Russian paramilitary group, and if the law and order would be there, definitely we can provide free and fair, fair election and to reintegrate this territory back to Ukraine. There is still uh, lots of questions about whether the country is doing enough uh, on anti-corruption measures, definitely. particularly the IMF, as you know, that is very concerned that you have not created these special anti-corruption courts. You seem to think it can be done within the existing court system. They do not. This They've... is not true. Okay, so so what is the problem with that idea? Why why are you so resistant to what the IMF nobody, is proposing? Okay. Nobody resistance. So, we have so, a full understanding with the IMF. And so what is the problem then? The answer is very simple. I wanted that all courts in the country should be anti-corruption. And this is the same way like they do in Canada, in the United mm -hmm. States. I'm absolutely confident that it is vital for us to create anti-corruption system in the whole court institution of Ukraine. And where would you say you're at, though, in that process? I think it, it should happen. It should be launched in a two weeks' time. <laughs> um, w how close or far do you think Ukraine is to getting membership in NATO? We need to reform the country to that Ukraine meet the criteria yes. of NATO membership. And again, we build up the new and effective army. We do the huge reforms in security and defense sector. And we enjoy very much the effective advisory support of the uh, Canada and uh, a lot of Canadian uh, instructors, military yes. instructors, are together with us in our training camps and I'm really satisfied. To, and by the way, many of Canadians speak fluent Ukrainian and are Ukrainian origin. origin. <laughs> well, let me end on that point. Why is that relationship so unique? It doesn't matter what government we have in this country, there is a strong commitment. Uh, no matter, we, I'm doing very much the cooperation with the Prime Minister Trudeau, we enjoy very much the cooperation with the Prime Minister Harper, and that means that our cooperation based not just on the uh, Prime Minister President content, sure, yes. but the, based on values. President, thank you for making the Thanks time. Thanks a lot. Appreciate it. Thank you. thank you. Thank you. Nice to meet you. Straight ahead, an Ontario man helps families rediscover heroic exploits of their ancestors. Now it's his turn to be honored. I'm Anna Maria Tremonti. Tomorrow on The Current, Jill Martins helps patients getting kidney transplants. Then her own son's overdose death made him a donor, and she got a perspective she never wanted. Her story on The Current, weekdays at 8.30 on CBC Radio 1. They are historic artifacts and priceless mementos from war that can connect Canadians with their ancestors who served in the military. But making that connection is easier said than done. So for the last four years, an Ontario man has made it his mission. Alison Crawford has the story. I'm not a collector in any way myself. An odd statement from a man who devotes much of his time and money to acquiring military memorabilia. It's all my own money and my own resources, both in travel 
I don't think you can put a monetary value on it when you return it to someone. McCormick has acquired dozens of items and returned them to soldiers' families and museums. It's called Project Honor and Preserve. We have families in Canada who don't even know that their great-grandfather served. And it's truly an honour for those items to be acquired and to be relocated with a family. Sometimes, though, McCormick gets stumped. We're currently working on an initiative of uh, a number of letters from a soldier who died in World War I. Those letters are now in the hands of the military police, a key partner in the project. At times we've uh, done some searching within our databases to find out uh, if we have any records. And in some cases we may find a fingerprint record or something like that. It's a cold case that has captured the heart of Lindsay Fry, a National Defence employee volunteering her time. It's incredible. Um, we have medals, we have photos, we have love letters, we have first-person accounts of what it was like to fight in the First World War in uh, France, and it's just, it's vast. It's, it's amazing. The young trench gunner named Eli joined up from St. John, New Brunswick in 1917. A prolific writer, Eli kept journals and wrote almost every day to friends, family, and his sweetheart. He's a joker. He has a really great sense of humor. His wife is equally um, to the task. She's, uh, they had a lot of love. But today, McCormick is in Ottawa for a special presentation. What, what I'd like to do, Minister, is present you with this memorial cross from a, a soldier who fell in World War I. It was originally awarded to the mother of Sergeant John Brown, who died in October 1916 at the Battle of the Somme. Until Brown's family is found, the medal will remain with the Minister of Defence. Family members have given the ultimate sacrifice, right, uh, to us. It is so important. And even if it can't be found, it's actually explaining it uh, to other people, saying, hey, by the way, this, is, this was a sacrifice. And it's one Sajjan promises to commemorate with an in-person presentation once McCormick and his team find the family of Sergeant Brown. Alison Crawford, CBC News, Ottawa. Just before we go, a quick recap of our top story. Aid agencies are overwhelmed by the vast numbers of hungry, desperate Rohingya now living in tent cities in Bangladesh. The numbers fleeing Myanmar every day are starting to slow, but nearly half a million displaced people now have no homes, no money, and no food. That's The National for this Monday night. For news at any hour, you can always go to cbcnews.ca. I'm Wendy Mesley. Thanks for watching.